So the topic that we're talking about today is lawless will abound. That was the scripture text that uh, Rick read from, which was Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 13. Lawlessness will abound, it says there. And I'm going to ask, as I, as I do this lecture, this sermon this morning, this is a very touchy subject. This is, these are topics that I'm talking about today that uh, can offend a lot of people sometimes. And if that's not the intention. I want to make that clear. The intention is to help us to come to a knowledge of what God wants in our lives, what he wants for us as individuals. You know, I've said it a number of times um, over the years, I've said God is looking for a way to save every single person. He wants every life to be preserved. But unfortunately, many of us, we may not choose that. So I'm going to ask, even if this seems to be stepping on some toes, it might seem a little uncomfortable for you, I want you to stay to the end of the sermon because there are some things that we're going to learn as we go through that for some people is quite surprising when they see what the Bible actually says about some of these things, and not only about these things, but on ways that we can overcome, ways that we can overcome the things, some of the vices that may have any of us or that have had some of us. Okay, because we all have something that is wrong with us. Every single one of us. There's no one that's born today that doesn't have something wrong, and that problem is sin. And I look around the world, and I, people are saying to me all of the time, what is happening in the world? What's going on? I mean, things we've never seen a year like 2020. And even recently, there was a representative that got up in front of uh, Congress at the 117th Congress, and he said a prayer. I don't know if you've heard about this. And when he closed the prayer, he said, Amen and a woman. What is that all about? He got a lot of heat for that, but other people thought that that was appropriate. You know, the word Amen means so be it. It's not talking about a man. It simply means so be it. But we feel this need to make everybody feel warm and fuzzy, to make everybody feel comfortable. And unfortunately, that has crept into Christianity. That's crept into, well, it hasn't crept into God's Word, but it's crept into people's translations of God's Word. There's a Bible that's been around since about 2012 called the Queen James Bible. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. The Queen James Bible, and it edits out all references to homosexuality in order to provide a Bible translation that's edited, this is their words, to prevent homophobic misinterpretation of God's Word. So where is the world headed? Where are we going? In this world, we, we live in a world where nobody wants to be accountable, nobody wants to be told that they're wrong, Nobody wants to admit that they're wrong. And you know, that started in the Garden of Eden. Adam wanted to blame his wife, and she wanted to blame the serpent, and everybody was blaming everybody else. And it's, it's the same today, but it's a little worse today because there's so many more people, and everybody's doing it to everybody else. So it's just multiplying. It's just a, a multiple of the same thing that happened in Garden once sin entered. And it seems like people don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Everything that's wrong seems to be acceptable. It seems that right is wrong, up is down, in is out, left is right. Where does it stop? Where does it stop? We live in a country now that's supposedly a Christian country where abortion is being made legal. I can't believe that the state that I live in, which was a pretty Christian state for the most part, I mean, we live on the fringes of the Bible Belt. What takes us out of the Bible Belt is northern Virginia, where Washington, D.C. is. That kind of removes us. But we are in an area where most people here, fortunately in this town, believe in God's Word, and they believe in the morality that's taught in the Bible. And they believe that certain things that the Bible says are true. I'm glad to live in a place like that, even though we have a mix of people and so we live in a state in Virginia where a baby can be born and you can decide, a mother can decide within a few days or the same day or within a few hours or that same day whether or not she wants to keep that baby. That's, that's just from what the Bible says. How am I supposed to accept that? 
How can I conscientiously see that taking place and not have something to say about it? You know, in ministry, the more exposure that we have as a ministry to people, the more questions are coming up. The more people are asking questions about things. And the, the thing is, I have to be careful not to give my opinion. And everybody here, we have to be careful not to give our opinions. We have to make this. This is where the answers have to come. And so what we're going to do, we're, we're going to look at some of these questions that have come up, and we're going to address them from a biblical point of view. And I just thought, you know, there are a lot of churches and ministries that are beginning to avoid these things because they're afraid of the consequences. Well, you know, I believe we have the protection of Almighty God, and I don't think we should ever stand down from preaching the Word and from preaching what the Bible says. So let's begin by reading a text. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to begin here because this describes very clearly the world in which we live. It's a text that we're all familiar with. And then we're going to take a little journey through Scripture and try to answer a few questions that have come up. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading in uh, verse... I'm just going to begin in verse 1. No, not verse 1. I'm in 1 Timothy. There we go. But I want 2 Timothy. Yes, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what it says. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Verse 6 says, For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, does this sound like those first five verses. Does that sound familiar? Is that what you see every single day all around us in the news, on the radio, on the internet? Well, if we turn on the internet, we see stuff. It's just, it's amazing the things that are happening. And the, not only the, the amount that you see it, the, the, it seems like the intensity of it. It's more intense and it's, it's more often that we see it as well. And then it mentions here in verse 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's interesting to me. We have the truth right here. The truth isn't a church or a denomination. It's not an organization. The truth is Christ Jesus. If we can't come to a knowledge of the truth, maybe it's because we're not taking in the truth. Maybe it's because we're not asking the spirit of truth to come into our minds and hearts, which is Christ Jesus. And maybe we're not asking for that, that and, and maybe that's hindering us somehow. And I'm, I'm pointing to myself, don't get me wrong, because I suffer from some of the things that we read about in the Bible. We all have some vice, something that wants to hold us captive, so to speak. And you know, typically we don't want others to know what that is, so we keep it to ourselves. So chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, since we're there, notice verse 1 here. Second, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy. Did I say first? I apologize. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, 
and they will turn their ears away to the, from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is what we're all called as individuals to do. And it doesn't mean to fulfill a ministry, your ministry. This is personal. This is for each individual. Each of us have a ministry. And part of that ministry is how we treat others. How do we respond when somebody wrongs us? What do we show them when we're talking about these things? If they try to justify something that's wrong and say, well, that's all right, you're a good person. Do I justify it myself? Or do I have a ministry? Do I want to be told what I want to hear, these itching ears? Or am I willing to stand up for what the truth of God's word says? I'm asking you these questions because the things that we're going to talk about again are not things that are easy to talk about. It's not always easy. So let's begin by addressing this idea of abortion. You know, this seems to be more and more justified. Younger people end up, uh, you know, there's a, a morning after pill that we've heard of. Um, there are a lot of horrible things in this world. So we need to address abortion. And while the Bible does not directly use the word abortion, let's see if we can find the principle in the Bible. You know, there are a lot of things that aren't actually talked about in the Bible, but if we study the Bible, we can conclude what the answer should be, whether it's right or wrong, if it's something that pleases God or not. So let's take a look at this text in Exodus on, on the PowerPoint, Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. So that's easy to remember. If anybody ever asks you, what does God have to say about abortion? Exodus 21, 22, 23. See? So let's take a look, and this is from the, um, the International Standard Version. It says, if two men are fighting and they strike a pregnant woman and her, child, her children are born prematurely, but there is no harm, he is surely to be fined as the husband of the woman demands of him, and he will pay as the court decides. If there is harm, then you are to require life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. So if the child is hurt, that's in the mother's womb, does God consider that a life? According to this text, God considers that a life. But there are people today who argue, well, it's not a life until so many months, or it's not a life until it comes out of the mother. It's not... It is a life. It is a life of conception. And this says, if a woman is pregnant, when does a woman become pregnant? At conception. You may not know it, but if that child is hurt as a result of something that you and I do to hurt that woman, then we have to pay. That's what the Bible says. So God considers this something that is displeasing. It's a life. It's precious to him. Remember, he's looking for a way to save every life. So the life of that conceived child is just as important as yours or mine. It's no less important. Just because we've established a relationship with God, it doesn't mean that he doesn't value that precious life that's in that woman's body. I hope that makes sense to you. So let's, let's move along. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2. Just a moment here. Yes, Genesis chapter 2. Verses 24 and 25. Take a look at this. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and uh, yeah, bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She, that she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I want you to notice here. There's this common misconception today that a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman. But it says here, right at the beginning of the Bible, verse 24 again, it's right there on the PowerPoint, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. It doesn't say anything about his husband. And they, that's the man and the woman, shall become one flesh. It's a man and a woman. This is how we were created. Male and female created he them, right? 
So once sin entered, it didn't take long for things to go downhill. Once sin entered, I mean, think about it. it not long after sin, murder happened. Cain killed Abel, didn't he? And then things got so bad by the time of Noah's day that God said, I have to wipe humanity out because of how wicked these people are. And there was this very small group that was living according to God's standard. At least one of them was. It was Noah. At least Noah is called righteous. Doesn't say anything about his family. They were with him. It's amazing. They, they, could have, they were probably righteous, I'm assuming, but they were saved by association for sure. And all somebody had to do in order to gain life at that moment, in order to live, was to get on the ark. That's all they had to do. Very simple task. But because they may have been worried about hurting the feelings of someone around them, they didn't do it. We don't know all of the reasons, but I'm sure that was one of them. And then as we read through the Genesis account, we see by Genesis chapter 19 that there was a perversion taking place that today seems to be normal. And there's a, there was a city called Sodom and Gomorrah. And today, in this world, we have the same things that were going on then. You have men that want to lie with men and women who want to lie with women. And homosexuality seems to be one of the many agendas that are on, in front of us every day. You know, we're looking at a very small percentage of the population probably less than 3% that are affecting the rest of the people. This little tiny group are making people feel like, I have to accept. I'm not saying we treat those people bad. We need to nurture them, care for them, love them. That life is precious to God. We need to treat them right. But how does God feel about these things? Let's get it from the Bible. Let's take a look here at this text. In Deuteronomy chapter 22. Now look at what this is talking about. This is just, let's just read the verse. Let it speak for itself. This is from the modern King James Version. It says, There shall not be the thing of a man on a woman. In other words, clothing. This is talking about clothing. There shall not be the thing of a man on a woman, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For whoever does these things is an abomination to Jehovah your God. So today, you know, my wife and I were watching HGTV, Home and Garden Television. And we're watching a, a program, you know, about people selling their houses. And a commercial comes on with this, on, for another network. You know, these networks now on cable, they seem to, inter, they do advertising for other networks now. And uh, I don't know, I just, I just realized that. I said that to my wife. She said, that's been going on for a long time. That shows how much attention I pay to it. But they do advertising for other networks. And there was this network about these drag queens that are dressing up, these men that are dressing as women and putting on makeup and trying to pass themselves off. This is saying that's an abomination to God, just putting on the garments of a woman or a woman putting on the garments of a man. It's an abomination. Now, styles change. Let's face it. They change. And we live according to the time that we live in. You know, back in uh, the days of the Jewish people, uh, a lot of the men wore a skirt. Well, today, men usually wear slacks. Now, if you're from certain parts of the world, they may still wear these garments. But in this country, men wear slacks or short pants sometimes. But to do otherwise, if I were to put on a woman's dress, some, a garment that was made for a woman, it would be wrong, wouldn't it, according to this text? Now, this word abomination, I want to take a look at it. Here it is in Hebrew, and it gives the Hebrew word, H8441, there on the PowerPoint, and it gives you the Hebrew word and the way to say it. I'm not going to try to say it, but it's, uh, here's the definition. A feminine, a feminine active participle of H8581, and I'll tell you what that is in just a moment. It says properly something disgusting. That is, as a noun, an abhorrence, especially idolatry or an idol. You, you can read through that, but I highlighted those words. This is what it literally means in Hebrew. Now, the, the H8581 means to loathe, to morally detest, to abhor something. So even the root word, the word that this is a participle of, means the same thing. So when God says that 
This is an abomination to him. The word that's used there means that he, he loathes it. He hates it. It's detestable. Because really what it is, is it's us trying to be something we weren't created to be. That's what it boils down to. Next, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. It says, if a man lies with a male he li as he lies with a woman, both of them shall be, have committed an abomination. Same word, same Hebrew word. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. But, you know, people look at this and they say, well, wait a minute. You know, we, we don't kill people for that today. And that's the first thing. You know, that was the Old Testament. That's that old bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament. That's what he wanted. But, you know, the God of the New Testament, he's a different God. He's that loving God. You know, he, th that God, his son came and, and Jesus showed us the love of, of that New Testament God. I, people have actually said this to me. But what does the New Testament say? Let's take a look and see if this, if this bloodthirsty, quote unquote, what people, that's what people have called God to me, unfortunately. This bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament changes his mind in the New Testament. Let's just take a look. Here in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, and I want you to know this is the Son of God speaking. This is Jesus. Okay? If, so if we believe the words of Jesus, and if we, if, as some call themselves a New Testament Christian, this is what Jesus says. Now, I'm a Bible Christian. I accept the, all of the Word of God, not just the New Testament. So here, Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, And he, that's Jesus, answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them as the be at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Didn't we just read that text in the Old Testament, in Genesis? That the man and the woman, the two shall become one, that he created the male and female? So Jesus is reiterating what's in that Old Testament, the, the oldest, one of the oldest parts of the Old Testament, right at the creation account. The Apostle Paul had something to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Take another look at that. I'm going to highlight it for you. Now, as you look at these things, as you look at those words that are highlighted, is there anyone, do you think these are in the, uh, the list of importance? Do you think they're listed in any numerical value in God's eyes? Is one of these any more of a sin than another? You see, what happens, though, in the mind of, of most of us most of us that are Christians, I'm going to put myself right smack dab in the middle of it because I used to think this way. I would, I would look at the commandments and I would say, oh, well, you know, um, lying probably isn't as bad as stealing. And, you know, uh, committing adultery is worse than lying or stealing. And, uh, you know, if I, if I kill someone, that's probably the worst thing that I could do. Why do I do that? Why do I look at the commandments and I enumerate them in, in order of, well, this one's worse than that one and that one's worse. Sin is sin. It doesn't matter. If I break one, I've broken them all. So when I look at this list, once again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, take a look. Fornicators. Is no worse than an idolater. They're, these are equal value. Adulterers, homosexuals, that's another thing. I'm going to stop there. This is what I used to do. I would look and I would say, well, homosexuality is much worse than adultery. See, you see what happens? Why is it worse? It's no worse. Sin is sin. It's something that's detestable. It's an abomination to God if I commit a sin. 
If I do any one of these things, but in the minds of most of us, we tend to categorize them. Oh, well, this one's worse than that. You know, being a drunkard is not nearly as bad as, as being an adulterer or a sodomite or a homosexual or an extortioner. I'm just drinking a little booze, that's all. It's all the same. It's all the same. If we can get that into our minds, that sin is sin, and we recognize that sin is what separates us from God, that's a start. Just recognizing that, that's a start. We need to recognize that. You see, you might look at this and say, well, that means you know, all hope is lost. Because you know, I've fallen into maybe one of these. I, I tend to put uh, my, my, you know, I, I have friends, I'm not a sports guy, but some guys will say, I tend to put football in front of spiritual things. Well, there's a form of idolatry, you see. Or if I put my work, there's something I can do that I've done, put my work in front of spiritual things, things that I want to accomplish in front of what God has for me to do. Or on the Sabbath, I might say, well, you know, it doesn't hurt if I just do this little thing over here. That's a form of idolatry. I'm putting myself before God. Sin is sin. So when we look at these things, we might look and say, well, you know, I've had these thoughts. I've had these ideas. I have these inclinations. What do I do? I I'm lost. And that's what happens to a lot of Christians. They feel lost at that moment. So... Let's take a look at another text here. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. This is the continuation. Let's back up. I want to back up. Let's read this again because I want to read this and then continue to the next verse. I want to tie this together for you. Keep in mind the questions that we're asking. What do I do? Here it is. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Jesus said that too, by the way. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And the next verse says this, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now many people will look at this and say, well, there you go, there you have it. You see, I'm okay because I believe in Jesus. So I'm all right in doing these things because it says here that I was washed, I was sanctified, I was justified. But is this true? Can I continue doing those things? That we, we often read this text and we miss a very important word, one little word that we miss. And I'm going to highlight that for you. Take a look at this. If I can get it to, there we go. And such were some of you. What does that mean? That indicates that there had to be a change. Something had to change in my life. What helps me to change? Well, this is where we have to go. How do I get there? How do I get to where these were things that I did? These were things that I used to do. These are things in my past, and I no longer go there. How do I get there? Because if they, they, that's what I was, or that's where I was, or this was something where we were at one time, or a place where we were, it says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of, our, in the, name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So how do we get here? How do we get to that point? That's where we want to discuss. And that's what I think is probably the most important aspect of this whole message. Because we all are sinners. And we all need to be washed and sanctified and justified. No matter how much of a Bible student we are, no matter how much we study, no matter how much we read and pray and spend time on our knees, we all need to be washed and sanctified and justified. How do I get there? Well, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to the book of Romans, and we're going to begin in chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And, um, boy, you know, I'm, this is uh, probably... Ed's favorite sermon to preach. Ed, Ed has a great appreciation for the things that we're going to read here in Romans. And we're, we're not going to read all of Romans 6, 7, and 8, but I want to suggest to you 
that in your personal study, if, if, even this afternoon, after you turn the computer off and you've tuned out from this lecture, read Romans 6, 7, and 8 prayerfully and consider some of the things that we've talked about. And if that doesn't lift you up and help you to want to serve God, I don't know what will. So Romans chapter 6, and I'm just going to begin in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. So we're seeing already something has to change, right? Verse 2, it says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So we're talking about death to sin here, dying to our former course. Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There's a big change here. Our walk changes. Who we are is going to change. How does that happen? Look at verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his, that's Jesus' death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, in other words, our old personality, our old ways, was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And it's not talking about... <coughs> It's talking about we can do this now in this body. Okay, that's what this means. So look at verse 7. For he who has died, to his sinful ways we're talking about, has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I want to stop there. This does not mean that we can keep doing those things. We have to be dead to sin. But how do I do it? How do I get there? because it's impossible for me on my own to do it. I can't do it in myself. What puts me there? What gets me to that point? Notice verse 12. Let's keep going. And we read this a couple of times on Wednesday nights, a Bible study. It says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your, your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as being instruments of righteousness to God. That's beautiful, isn't it? Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And we're going to drive this home as we go through. So many people look at that and say, I'm not under the law because of this. But it says you're not under law, but under grace. Let's keep going. Verse 15, what then, shall we, what then shall we say because we are not under law, but under grace? Um, certainly not. Do you not know to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are that one's slave whom you obey? Whoever, of, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So in other words, whoever you're following, that's your master. If I follow Christ, he's my master. If I'm not following Christ, Who's my master? It's the devil. You've got to follow one or the other. Verse 17. But God be thanked that though you were, were, same word that Paul used, right? That though you, in, in Corinthians, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the, weaknesses, the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, 
So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's talking about fruitage here. It's talking about bearing fruitage. It's talking about the law here. And it says here that you're not under law if you're living in righteousness. Well, what does that mean? We have to define that. We have to look at that. So let's turn in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Remember we're, we're the, what the topic is. We're talking about lawlessness will abound. And when we look around the world today, what do we see? We see those very things happening. Right is wrong. Wrong is right. Left is right. Up is down. In is out. Everything is the opposite. Everything is just topsy-turvy. It's all turned upside down in this world. So what we're trying to establish here from the beginning, is when we hear things and we're told to accept them, and we're told that, well, this is just how I am. This is just who I am. How do we deal with that? How do we overcome that? And how do we take a stand for what God wants us to do? So let's look at, we've read Romans chapter 6. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 5, and I'm going to begin in verse 16. Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Sounds easy enough, but what does that mean? Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. Interesting. And we've explained this a bunch of times, but it's worth repeating. If the speed limit is posted at 70, and I'm doing 70, I can't be penalized. I'm not under the penalty of the law. But once I go 71, 2, or 3, once I break that law, now I can suffer the penalty of the law. That puts me under law. But if I'm doing God's will, I'm not under law. You see what I'm saying? So let's continue on. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Now, he just said we're not under law, but look at what he's saying. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's not that the law is done away with. The law is there. Because if I do any of these things, I'm breaking it. But all hope isn't lost. Paul doesn't stop there. He keeps going. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit... In other words, if I have the spirit of Christ, if I have the mind of Christ, if I follow him, this is what's going to happen. The fruit of the spirit in verse 22 is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. You know, that last one, self-control, is one that I've had a problem with because I have a little temper sometimes, and it gets to me. Certain things, I have a tipping point, and I can be pushed and pushed, and then once I get to a certain point, I really need to work on that one, you see? And so when we look at this, it says again in verse 23, against such, this fruitage of God's spirit, doing the will of God, there's no law against that. But he continues in verse 24. He says, and those who are Christ's 
have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So when I look at these texts and I recognize that we're told that I can overcome, we're told that if, I'm, if I have the fruitage of the Spirit, how do I get that? Well, first of all, I have to pray. I have to ask God to help me to reveal that I have the, His Spirit with me. Help me to overcome. I have to pray. Next, I need to live according to the things that I'm asking for. If there's a vice, if there's something that I have that's in my life that prevents me from doing God's will, I need to get it out of my life. If there's something that promotes a thought that's going to make me think something that's going to cause me to walk down the wrong path, the best thing to do is just remove it. It's not always easy. It's not, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But ask God to give you the strength to be able to remove that from your life. Uh, because in ourselves, we're not going to be able to do it. But if we get on our knees and we say, Heavenly Father, help me, and it's not going to be an easy prayer because some of the things you're going to have to ask to get rid of, you might really enjoy doing. It might be something that you really want, that you really love, that you enjoy. But do you want to be in God's kingdom? Do you want to be with him forever? And if you do, you have to ask yourself, will I be able to do this thing that I enjoy so much in the kingdom? Because if you're not going to be able to do it there, we better get rid of it now. Because when Christ comes, he's not going to knock that cigarette out of my mouth. If I'm a drunkard, he's not going to knock the booze out of my hand. If I have a problem with immorality, he's not going to take that pornography channel off of my computer. I need to get rid of it now. You need to unload your burden now. Now is the day of salvation. That's what we're told. Now is the day. Now is the time. We've done extensive sermons on John chapter 14. And, how we, and, and I invite you, if you haven't viewed them, view them on how Christ helps us to overcome, on how the Spirit of Christ can come into our minds and hearts. In fact, uh, let's just take a look at the text that we looked at today, Colossians 1. We looked at this during Sabbath school. I, I'm not going to go to John 14 because I'll get tied up there and I'll be there for an hour. Um, but John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17, if you just read that part of the gospel, it will really sink into your mind what helps us to overcome. And Colossians chapter 1, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time talking and finding it in this Bible because this isn't my normal study Bible. There it is, Colossians chapter 1. And if I begin in, in verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. We talked about this in Sabbath school today. Verse 27, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. John 14 begins by talking about this, the comforter, how we can be helped, how he will come to us, how he will remove these things from us. You know, if, if I begin to empty myself, you know, these people that are into these spiritistic things, like yoga and martial arts where they empty their minds. You empty anything. You know, if, if I have a glass and, and it's sitting here and we're outside, eventually something's gone in that, whether it's rain or debris. If you have a void, something's going to fill that void eventually. It's going to happen. So if I empty my mind like these people want us to do, somebody's going to fill that spot. Don't empty your mind. Fill it with Christ Jesus. Let him come in and it'll, it'll move that other stuff out of your life. But you have to ask for it. You have to pray for him to help you. And we need to address um, something really, really important while we're talking about these things. While we're talking about um, Christ in you, while we're talking about how do I get rid of these things? You know, so many people today say, well, it's not my fault that I'm the way that I am. Some people, uh, and, and you know, I'm, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this is not true. Because since the fall of man, we are genetically defective, every single one of us. 
All of us have a problem. I mentioned that at the outset. That problem is sin. So since Adam and Eve ate the fruit, there is something genetically wrong with humanity. So there are people that say, you know, you're born as an alcoholic. I'm not going to take that to task because we're genetically defective. Some people will say, well, I was born a homosexual. I'm not going to take that to task either because we were born genetically defective. I was born with the propensity to be with as many people of the opposite sex as I can. Well, I'm not going to say that you're not born with that propensity because we're all born into sin. But I want to use an illustration because this question came up. What if someone is born as a homosexual? What do, what do I do? What do I do? And this is an illustration that I've heard uh, my brother Rick use, and I really appreciate it. He, he uh, got it from a friend of his that was teaching a uh, youth Sabbath school, if I remember right, and that question came up. And so this is my illustration, but it's, it's so well put. I, I, I've never heard a better illustration. A person might say, I was born as a homosexual. This is, I have no choice. This is how I was born. And for some reason in the world today, they say, well, yes, you were born that way. That's okay. That's what people will say. They'll justify it. That's okay. That's just how you are. That's who you are. You be who you are. Well, the Bible, we just read in Romans, we need to die to ourselves. We read in 1 Corinthians and in the Old Testament and New Testament, in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, that it's wrong. We can lose our life for that. What do we do? Why do we justify that? Where if I said, well, you know, I'm a heterosexual, I'm a male, and it's my desire to have the, a relationship with as many women as I can, I was born this way. That wouldn't go over very well. They would say, well, wait a minute, you're married. Yeah, but I was born this way, I can't control it. This is how I was born. This is just, you were born a homosexual, I was born a heterosexual. So the desire that you have to be with someone with the opposite sex, I have that same desire, but much stronger, to be with as many women as I can. Why is that not justified for me? You see, sin is sin. The homosexual sin is no worse than my sin. So what do I do? Do I give up? No. You see, I don't try to justify my wrong. I don't try to live according to what I want to do. But remember what Christ said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. That's the prayer we need to pray. Father, not my will, not what I want. Help me to overcome. Send the spirit of your son into my mind and heart that I can be changed. Put in me a new heart, O oh God. You see, to believe that we can be saved while doing these things, if I have truly believed in my heart that I could be saved by doing that, I'm not reading my Bible. And I'm just not accepting what it says. I might be reading it, but I might not want to do it. Well, if I'm reading it and I see it and it's right here, I need to make the changes. And I may not be able to do it on my own. But if I get on my knees and I ask God to help me and I work in accordance with that and I put away everything that's going to make me focus on my vice, put those things out of my life. Get rid of them. Clean out your house, so to speak. Right? Sweep the room out and fill it with Christ Jesus. And if I do that, I'll be able to overcome those things. You see, if we keep doing those things and we keep living that way and we keep trying to justify it, we're actually cheapening. We're, we're mocking the blood of Christ. We're mocking him. We're saying, you can't fix me. I'm just going to wait till you come and then you can fix me. No, he promises he can fix you now. That's what the Bible's telling us. That's what Romans is telling us. He can fix you today. Because once he comes, it's too late. We've got to fix it now. We have to fix it now. We have to be ready. Now is the day of salvation. So anything, any vice that you have in your life, I'm begging you, if you want eternal life, 
Follow what God's word says. Try to get those things out. God is pleading with his people. You know, I, I'm doing this thing. I'm reading right now. I'm reading through the Old Testament. And I'm just, you know, I've read these things before. But when you read it in a large volume very quickly, I can't believe the number of times he, please, come back to me. Be my people. Worship me this way. Do what I'm asking. All I'm asking, just this one little thing. Just do this. And they keep going back. I mean, I, it's, I got frustrated. I got frustrated reading the Bible because I'm thinking, no wonder Jesus said they're a stiff-necked people. It's no wonder. I mean, I'm reading it and I'm saying, am I this way? So now I'm starting to look at myself and saying, you know, in some ways I am this way. There are things in my life that I keep going back to, keep going back. But he promises us that he will get it out of our lives. I've used this illustration. Years ago, I used to have a filthy mouth. I'd say anything. You would not believe the vile garbage that would come out of my mouth. And when I got mad, especially. And uh, I remember telling a friend, he was an elder in the, the church that I grew up in. And I told him, I, this was when I was first starting to study the Bible. I said, you know, I don't think I'll ever be able to get this under control. He says, you know what? The day's going to come. You keep studying. You keep applying the things that you're reading, and you keep living according to the way the Bible wants you to. And when you do that, the day's going to come that you're going to be working or doing something, and you're going to smash your thumb or your finger, and you're not even going to say a cuss word. And I laughed at him. I thought it was the funniest. I said, there is no way that will ever happen. And it was probably about a year or so later, I was working on a car, and I was driving a kingpin out of a Ford truck. And... Uh, when I came down with the hammer, the thing slipped off and it hit right here. It actually, my watch actually cut my arm open and it chipped the crystal on the watch. And, and I just, you know, I just came back and went, oh, you know, it, was just, it, it hurt so bad. And about five minutes later, I realized I didn't say a cuss word. I didn't even think of a cuss word. That was, that was a big moment for me. And it's, it's amazing how it can happen, and you think it can't. In fact, in your mind, you'll say, I know that can't happen. I know it can't. So in this world we live in, you know, today, it seems everyone gets a trophy. Nothing is wrong. Everybody's a winner. Nobody's a loser. There's nothing that's bad. I accept you where you are. You don't have to worry about me. I think we need to love people. If a person comes through the door and we know that they have a particular lifestyle, Let's not look down on them. Let's welcome them with open arms. Treat them like human beings. Share God's word with them. If they ask questions, we have to answer them honestly. We don't want to dance around it. Don't be afraid to say what God's word says, but do it in a loving and kind way. And just, just say, look, this isn't me. I'm just sharing with you what the word says. And you can accept it, or you can try to work on it. You can reject it if you want. But I'm still going to treat you like a neighbor. I'm still going to treat you with loving kindness, regardless of the decision you make, regardless of your choice. I'm going to treat you humane, humanely. So again, does everyone win the race? Does everyone get a trophy? Well, we know that uh, we're told that the road to life is very narrow. And I want you to notice Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Beginning in verse 24 on the PowerPoint, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. He had a walk with Christ, didn't he? He met him personally, didn't he? It changed his life. It took this man from being a murderer to being one of the foremost writers of the New Testament one of the great apostles of Christ. He knew how Christ could change a person. How do we get here? How do we get to where Paul was? 
How do we get to that point? Well, we've discussed it. A relationship with Jesus. Submitting to his will. Following the things that he's told us. Simply listening. Praying and asking and listening to what he says. And I'm not saying you're going to hear a voice. That's not what I'm talking about. Listening by doing. And I've never heard God speak, but I've had some really strong feelings that I know God put a thought in my mind or in my heart. And you know, Christ is our mediator. He's the son of God and he's the son of man. So no one knows better than he does what we go through and how divinity views it, right? He knows how repulsive it is to God when we sin. He brings us to the Father. So when we submit to the Son, we're submitting to the Father, and the Father sees us. And when we do that, what will he see? When we stand before him, if we have Christ in us, he sees his Son because we've taken on that personality. He changes our character. He changes our heart. He changes our desire because we've asked him to. Not because he beat the door down. Not because he forced his way in and had to crack it open with a crowbar. No, it's because we're inviting him in. When you pray, let, let's just turn to Psalm 51. Just a couple of texts and we'll close. Psalm 51. I want you to take a look at this briefly. And this is a prayer that uh, King David prayed. And we know, you know, a lot of times we look at David and we see all the bad things that he did. Yep, he, he had a lot of things that he had been involved in, but... Uh, Look at what his prayer was. Psalm 51, in verse 10, verses 10 and 11, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. That's the prayer. That's the prayer we need to pray. Did it make a difference in David's life? Absolutely. 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 And the last text, I'd like you to turn to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, because, you know, it's amazing what these prophets of old knew, the relationship they had with their Heavenly Father. The things that they knew He had in store for them, even though they, they couldn't see it, they, they knew that it was there. That's faith. The things that you don't see, but you know and you believe, right? And Jeremiah says here in in Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says Jehovah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, and I could say over and over again, though I was a husband to them, says Jehovah, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Jehovah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So you see, we live in a world where lawlessness will abound. But he promises us that if we ask him, no matter what our vice is, we can try to justify ourselves. But if we just put ourselves aside, if we die to ourselves, he will help us to overcome whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. If somebody would have said to you, to, about Saul when he was walking on the earth killing Christians, that man's going to be a Christian one day, and he's going to be standing up and fighting for Christ. What do you think the neighbors would have thought? There is no way. That is never going to happen. It can't happen. He's a Pharisee. Won't happen. But you see, with God, all things are possible. And we need to remember that. You see, we can have the Spirit of Christ. And by following the things that are in the Bible, no matter what our vice is, whether we, remember Paul says, these things some of you were. Sodomites, homosexuals, idolaters, idolaters, drunkards, all of these things, He's saying, you can overcome them. I know because when he was speaking to the Corinthian congregation, he's saying, you had done that. So we're not cheapening God's grace. He sanctifies us, right? 
These are the, he justifies us. He does that for us. We don't do it ourselves. So if we do these things and we stand for what's right and we're not afraid to share the gospel and we preach the word of God, we get on our knees, we ask God to send the spirit of truth to us that we can know and understand. And we ask him to help us to overcome. We can have the victory. And that's the victory that Jesus gives us.